Once again, Lord, we thank you and praise thee for the opportunity and the richness that this hour has to offer in your word. We pray that you'll continue to bless the speakers and the hearers, that these things would have their work in our heart and minds for not only our sake, but those around us. Lord, we pray for those who are here that have a burden for this work and this message, that you'll give them special utterances in their homes, in their towns, in their places of challenge, and that you give them special angels that will guide them and that will give them the fullness of fellowship and the joy that can't be denied for those who bear truth. We thank you, Lord, once again, and hear our prayers and remember us because it's a strange day with a strange work. And let the mystery of godliness, divinity, and humanity begin to ring in our souls and our being. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to look at Daniel 11, verse 40, this hour. Begin by reading it. Daniel 11, verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. I believe this verse parallels in purpose, Revelation 9, verse 15. Revelation 9, verse 15 says, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Now what I mean by purpose, I'm using that word purposely, is that the Lord used Revelation 9, 15 to empower his people. And... uh, This is when Jesus came down in Revelation chapter 10, August 11th, 1840. This is where power entered the Advent movement based upon a prediction in God's word identifying when a great empire would collapse. And there was a purpose intended for that understanding that God designed for his people. And I believe that verse 40 of Daniel 11 has the identical purpose Um, within it. But let's uh, begin with uh, putting uh, the writings of Uriah Smith into our our thoughts. This is from Publishing Ministries, Publishing Ministry, page 356. Everything that can be done should be done to circulate thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It is God's helping hand. Now, how many books, I'm not speaking about Spirit of Prophecy books, but how many books does Sister White say are God's helping hand? This one. Um, Every Seventh-day Adventist should own Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith, and in other places she says that we should be giving them out to our neighbors, so we shouldn't just own one. We should have a whole box of them. And there are things in... Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation, um, that I personally disagree with, and I, and I truly think he was incorrect upon it, but still, in spite of that, I truly believe that this is by far the very best book on Daniel and Revelation that's ever been written humanly. It is the classic, and, and I have a whole, I'm like you probably, I have a whole bookshelf of uh, books about Daniel and Revelation written by Adventist authors, and none of them come close to this book. I, 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 with the exception of Haskell's, but still, I personally, and I know there's a difference. Some people like Haskell's writing style above Uriah Smith's writing style, but personally, I also like Uriah Smith's style of writing above Haskell's, but Haskell's is a good book too, but let's read on. Instruction has been given me that the important books containing the light that God has given regarding Satan's apostasy in heaven should be given a wide circulation just now, for through them the truth will reach many minds. Patriarchs and prophets, Daniel and the Revelation, and the great controversy are needed now as never before. They should be widely circulated because the truths they emphasize will open many minds. 
Notice where that book sets. <laughs> right there with patriarchs and prophets and their great controversy. Daniel and the Revelation. Now, um, if we're going to address Daniel 11, verse 40, and we're going to determine who the king of the south and the king of the north are, then we will have to base our, our at least our foundational definition of the king of the south and the king of the north uh, on Daniel chapter 11, because the struggle between the king of the south and the king of the north only takes place in Daniel chapter 11. So if there is a uh, prophetic way to determine who the king of the south and the king of the north are, then it's going to have to be in Daniel chapter 11. And uh, in verse 5 is the starting point to start identifying who the king of the south is, and uh, Uri Uriah Smith gives the, the pioneer reasoning, which is sound, on determining who the king of the south and the king of the north are. So in verse 5 it says, And the king of the south shall be strong in one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Now, we start in verse 5, but perhaps, for the record, let me just go back up into verse 1. The Verse 1 begins uh, in the times of the Medes and the Persians. Uh, I, and also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him, and now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three princes in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. Now, if you read Uriah Smith and Haskell, you realize that actually there were more than four princes that stood up during that history, but these are the four prominent ones. And uh, I'm only throwing this in. This is a, another sidetrack that perhaps I shouldn't throw in, but I will throw in that many times when you see a kingdom about to change over, you'll see four powers illustrated. So the fact that in this history there was really more than four princes, but inspiration only identifies four. And the fourth one that was far richer, if you read Uriah Smith, he's the one that brought Greece on the scene of history because he decided he wanted to conquer Greece. And he, get, and he was rich, he had a lot of money, and he went and he attempted to conquer Greece um, just for his foolish pride, and he never, the thing that he succeeded to do was get the Greece people, the Greeks, um, irritated about the whole thing, and they decided they wanted to retaliate, and this is the force, this is the providential forces that brings Alexander the Great, the next kingdom of Bible prophecy, into history was this uh, Persian king antagonizing them. But as kingdoms change many times, you'll see four illustrated, and uh, you know, whether it's four um, angels that are being held at the Euphrates, and on and on and on. I want to point this out here because we will touch on that when we get into the trumpets. But in verse 2, Persia, and in verse 3 we see, and a mighty king, Alexander the Great, a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will, and when he shall stand up his kingdom shall be broken. And we know from previous passages in Daniel and from the historical record that after Alexander the Great, his kingdom, and his kingdom is the kingdom that is being used as the point of reference for the rest of the book of Daniel. Even when the prophecy changes from literal to spiritual, it's still uh, built upon a spiritual application of Alexander the Great's kingdom. And his kingdom here is divided into four parts. Um, Verse 4, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. And then we're at verse 5, and the story begins with the king of the south. These four kingdoms that come out of Alexander the Great's fall, um, east, north, south, west, towards the four winds of heaven, but history and prophecy teaches that very shortly after that division, there was only two kingdoms that continued to struggle to reestablish Alexander the Great's original kingdom. That was the basic struggle going on. Uh, each of these kings wanted to take control of the whole kingdom. And in verse 5, we see the king of the south introduced, and then underneath it on the screen, you see what Uriah Smith says about it. Um, 
articulating the pioneer position. The King of the North and the King of the South are many times referred to in the remaining portion, portion of this chapter. It therefore becomes essential to an understanding of the prophecy clearly to identify these powers. When Alexander's pro the empire was divided, the different portions laid toward the four winds of heaven, west, north, east, and south. These divisions, of course, to be reckoned from the standpoint of Palestine, the native land of the prophet. The division of Alexander's kingdom with respect to Palestine was situated as follow. Cassandra had Greece, which lay to the west. Lysimachus had Tra Thrace. Seleucus had Syria and Babylon, which lay principally to the east, and Ptolemy had Egypt, which lay to the south. During the wars and revolutions which for long ages succeeded, these geographical boundaries were frequently changed, but whatever changes might occur, these first divisions of the empire must determine the names which these portions of the territory should ever afterward bear. And we have no standard by which to test the application of the prophecy, that is, whatever power at any time should occupy the ter territory which at first constituted the kingdom of the north, that power would be the king of the north. And whatever power should occupy that which first constitu constituted the kingdom of the south, that power would so long be the king of the south. We speak of only these two because they are the only ones afterwards spoken of in the prophecy. So, what's the rule? The power that controls Egypt is the king of the south. The power that controls Syria or Babylon, and we're going to say Babylon from this point onward, is the king of the north. As this story proceeds in... Uh, Verse 14, we read it last night, or we at least referred to it. Let's read verse 14. This struggle of the descendants of Alexander the Great continues on until verse 16, but in verse 14, which is still de dealing with uh, the Egyptian and Syrian kings, in verse 14 it says, In those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south, also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision but they shall fall. Now notice, for many verses, the Syrian king here, many verses before verse 14, the Syrian king, the king of the north, is under discussion. So, technically, the grammatical statement here in verse 14, it's saying, and also the robbers of thy people. This is introducing a new power. And this is worth taking note of. Because those of us in Adventism that have come to accept the false view of the daily and try to build their model of the book of Daniel by emphasizing the work that Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary as being the daily, because they have chosen a false model to look at the book of Daniel with, then they make great efforts to try to establish some historical points of reference to justify this position. In fact, if you take advantage of the Oklahoma videotapes where we had the discussion on Daniel 11, um, you will find that in verse 14, he made a, an attempt to teach that this robbers of thy people was Antiochus Epiphanes, and it just doesn't hold water, but... The pioneers believed that the robbers of the people were Rome, okay? And this is important because in verse 14, the robbers of the people are going to do what? They're going to establish the vision. And if you want to have a model where um, you're obscuring the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary in terms of the daily, then you want something to establish the vision that has to do with Antiochus Epiphanes coming in and desecrating the sanctuary in Jerusalem. But if you believe that Bible prophecy is teaching about the movements of Rome at the end of the world, then you agree with the pioneers that this new power introduced in verse 14 is Rome. And this is what Uriah Smith says on verse 14. We just read it. A new power is now introduced. Notice, a new power. If it was Antiochus Epiphanes, it would be the same power. He was a Syrian king. 
And new power is now introduced, the robbers of thy people, literally, says Bishop Newton, the breakers of thy people. Far away on the banks of the Tiber, a kingdom had been nourishing itself with ambitious projects and dark designs. Small and weak at first, it grew with marvelous rapidity in strength and vigor, reaching out cautiously here and there to try its prowess and test the vigor of its warlike arm till conscious of its power, it boldly reared its head among the nations of the earth and seized with invincible hand the helm of their affairs. Henceforth, the name of Rome stands upon the historic page, destined for long ages to control the affairs of the world and exert a mighty influence among the nations, even to the end of time. Now, we're dealing with verse 14, and Rome actually doesn't begin making its movements of taking over the world that Uriah Smith is speaking of here until verse 16. But notice what William Miller says about this verse. The king of the south in this verse without any doubt means the king of Egypt, but what the robbers of thy people mean remains yet a doubt perhaps to some that it cannot mean Antiochus or any king of Syria. It is plain. For the angel had been talking about that nation for a number of ver verses previous and now says also the robbers of thy people, of evidently implying some other nation. Again, to establish the vision must mean to make sure, complete, or fulfill the same. And if it cannot be shown that the Grecian kingdom was to rob the people of God, I think it must mean some other nation which would do these acts to which every word will apply. And to this we need not be at a loss, for at this very time which the angel is speaking, Rome, the last kingdom in Daniel's vision, did exalt itself. And this kingdom did have the very marks in the vision and in the events following. Now, if, if you were thinking and paying close, I know you're all thinking, if you, if you could understand the question that I was wanting to ask right now before I ask it, you would, you would recognize that Uriah Smith and William Miller here um, are saying two different things about a different subject than we're on. And what, what's the, where is William Miller disagreeing with Uriah Smith here? Uriah Smith ended up teaching that the last kingdom was not Rome. He ended up teaching that the last kingdom to come to his end in verse 45 was who? Turkey. But notice what William Miller believed. This is a foundation to Adventism, not just James White believed this. The last kingdom to come to his end and under his help was William Miller. But brothers and sisters, what establishes the vision of Daniel 10 through 12, because it's all the same vision, is not Antiochus, the Syrian king. It's Rome. And that's a foundational understanding of Adventism, no matter what the theologians come to decide. <clears throat> Rome, we've looked at this uh, thought um, a couple times already. In uh, Daniel 8, 9, there was three geographical areas that uh, Rome needed to overcome before it was established as uh, ruling the world supremely. And in, in Daniel Revelation, Uriah Smith is dealing with this. He says the little horn, this is the little horn of verse 9 of Daniel 8 that comes out of the four winds of verse 8 of Daniel 8. The little horn waxed great toward the south. This was true of Rome. Egypt was made a province of the of the Roman Empire B.C. 30 and continued for some centuries. The little horn waxed towards the east. This was also true of Rome. Rome conquered Syria B.C. 65 and it made it a province. The little horn waxed great towards the pleasant land. So did Rome. Judea is called the pleasant land in many scriptures. The Romans made it a province of their empire, B.C. 63, and eventually destroyed the city and the temple and scattered the Jews over the face of the whole earth. In Daniel 8, verse 9, the threefold conquering of Rome in order to establish it on the throne of the earth is paralleled in verses 16 and 17 um, of Daniel 11. The same conquering is portrayed. Uriah Smith says this, although Egypt could not stand before Antiochus, the king of the north, Antiochus could not stand before the Romans who now came against him. Now, what you need to understand, maybe you do, but Uriah Smith, he goes one verse at a time, maybe a couple verses at a time, but he, from the beginning of Daniel to the end of Daniel, 
in sequential order, and same with Revelation. He'll take a verse, he'll comment on it, and he's been commenting on the previous verses in da of Daniel 11, de dealing with the Syrian king. And here he's getting into verse 16, so he's speaking as if we've been following him in his discussion about the Syrian king for quite a while. And he says, although Egypt, and that Syrian king had been wanting to conquer Egypt, the king of the south, the Syrian king, uh, which was part, which controlled Babylon, was the king of the north. Although Egypt could not stand before Antiochus, the king of the north, Antiochus could not stand before the Romans, because we're in verse 16 now. Now the Romans are coming into the prophecy, who now came against him. No kingdoms were longer able to resist this r rising power. Syria was conquered and added to the Roman Empire when Pompey, B.C. 65, deprived Antiochus Asiaticus of his possessions and reduced Syria to a Roman province. The same power was also to stand in the Holy Land and consume it. Rome became connected with the people of God, the Jews, by alliance, B.C. 162, from which date it holds prominent place in the prophetic calendar. It did not, however, acquire jurisdiction over Judea by actual conquest till B.C. 63 and then in the following manner. Now, the League with the Jews, 162. Anyone know when William Miller places the League with the Jews? 158 B.C. William Miller came to the conclusion the League with the Jews was 158 B.C. And William Miller does stuff with that date. He agrees with, with Uriah Smith. The power is introduced into the prophecy when it comes into connection with the people of God. He just came to a different historical date. And <laughs> it's interesting. It isn't part of this study. I'm not suggest. I'm just. I'm just trying to challenge you on and your thinking. When he arrives at this date of 158, you know what William Miller does? He makes a case that Rome had a number, and its number was six, six, six. And it's saying from the time that pagan Rome came in contact with God's people until the power of pagan Rome had been removed. When was the power of paganism removed? 508. 508. If you do the math, that's 666 years. But that's outside the scope of this study. I, I'm just trying to stir your curiosity into the works of the pioneers because they were digging into the books of Daniel and Revelation and the history associated with them like you wouldn't believe. It's amazing the kind of reasoning they were doing. But this is just one little um, place where William Miller is different than the standard Adventist position. In any case, they had to conquer three um, areas. Verse 17, the south. Verse 16 brought us down to the conquest, still reading your eyes, Smith. Verse 16 brought us down to the conquest of Syria and Judea by the Romans. Rome had previously conquered Macedon and Thrace. Egypt was now all that remained of the whole kingdom of Alexander, not brought into subjection to the Roman power, which power now set its face to enter by force into that country. But the upright ones of the text, who, who are the upright ones in this passage? The Jews, the upright ones of the text are doubtless meant the Jews who gave him assistance already mentioned. Without this, he must have failed. With it, he completely subdued Egypt to his power, B.C. 47. Now, one more slide, I think. Maybe two more slides. Daniel and Revelation continuing on. By verses 23 and 24, we're brought down this side of the league between the Jews and the Romans. 161, to the time when Rome had acquired universal dominion. The verse now before us brings, us brings to view a vigorous campaign against the king of the south. Egypt and the occurrence of a notable battle between great and mighty armies. Did such events as these transpire in the history of Rome about this time? They did. This was the war between Egypt and Rome, and the battle was the Battle of Actium. If you, if you caught a discrepancy, not a discrepancy, but a, a distinction being made there, um, Uriah Smith saying that Rome took Egypt in B.C. 47, but then he further elaborates about the battle in B.C. 31, and the battle in B.C. 31 is the one where Rome begins to rule the world supremely. You, did you catch that? Let me back up. See here in the bottom of this screen, uh, 
B.C. 47, Rome subdues Egypt, B.C. 47. But here he's talking about the war between Egypt and Rome at the Battle of Actium, which we've already demonstrated is, is 31 B.C. And he's going to comment about this battle. The battle was fought September 2nd, B.C. 31, at the mouth of the Gulf of Ambracia, near the city of Actium. The world was at stake for which these stern warriors, Anthony and Caesar, now played. This battle doubtless marks the commencement of the time mentioned in verse 24. We've dealt with that. Um, from B.C. 31 to the year 330, pagan Rome ruled the world supremely until it moved um, its capital to Constantinople. Now, if you remember, there's a quote that we be looked at a little bit last night, I believe, or the night before, and you see just a, a, a part of that quote right at the top of the screen. The prophecy of the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in the fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. What prophecy? The prophecy of Daniel 11. Much of the history that's been fulfilled in Daniel 11 will be repeated when Daniel 11 is fulfilled. That's what she's telling us. And then she quotes verses 30 to 36. We looked at that. Um, if there's a history in Daniel 11 that's going to be repeated that we really need to understand well, it's verses 30 to 36. But she doesn't, she's not excluding it to the history of verses 30 to 36. She's saying much of the history in Daniel 11 is going to be repeated. There's other histories in Daniel 11 that are going to be repeated. What I'm going to share with you here, hopefully, is not a, not a major point, but it is something that I hope you see because it will encourage you to dig deeper into the histories of Daniel 11, and maybe it will help us to see how some of this history is repeated. So, um, this is the school. Let's use some rules. Um, what determines who is the king of the south and the king of the north? The power that controls Egypt, the king of the south. The power that controls Babylon, the king of the north. Now, in verse 15, the power that controlled Syria or Babylon um, was the Syrian kings. So what were they? They were the king of the north. But in verse 16, they're conquered by Rome, pagan Rome. So what happens in verse 16? There's a new king of the north. In verse 16, uh, one of the things that happens is that pagan Rome becomes the king of the north. Now, he's got a con there's, there's something to, uh, to throw in here that we haven't discussed. Pagan Rome has different times that it rules. Pagan Rome rules the world um, supremely from 31 B.C. Um, till 330. Uh, it, pagan Rome, that's, that's one aspect of the rule of pagan Rome. That's when it ruled supremely. But as a kingdom of Bible prophecy, it ruled um, from verse 16 here, when the Grecian king, when it conquered that third, third power, when it conquered Egypt, all the way until 538. As a kingdom of Bible prophecy, as a fourth kingdom of Bible prophecy, it went all the way to 538. You follow me? So there's two different distinctions about time periods that pagan Rome ruled. It ruled supremely for 360 years. It ruled as the fourth kingdom of Bible prophecy till 538. But it continued even beyond that to be the, the Roman Empire until when? Until 1449. So if you're going to try track the history of pagan Rome prophetically, you have to know that it was fulfilling different historical um, pictures at different points in time. And pagan Rome becomes the king of the north when it conquers Syria. It still hasn't conquered all three geographical areas, but it has become the king of the north. There's a difference there. It doesn't become the king of the north when it conquers Egypt. It becomes the king of the north when it conquers Babylon. And then, what did it do? What, what did we just read that it did? Um, it had to conquer Egypt in 47 B.C., I think it was. Now, who was Egypt? 
ah, so at that point, the king of the south is gone. Well, unless you want to call pagan Rome the king of the south also, if you want to do that. But in verse 16, pagan Rome becomes the king of the south, but when it conquers Egypt, um, the king of the south is out of the picture prophetically, all right? King of the south. I will. The power that controls Egypt is, is what? King of the South. And what did pagan Rome do to Egypt in 47 BC? Conquered what? So, who's the King of the South? Rome, except I, I don't see it that way. But I, but I can buy that, prophetically, King of the South. But he's already been established as the King of the North. The story is really about Rome, it's about the King of the North all the way through. What I want you to see is that in 47 BC, pagan Rome conquered the king of the south. And then, then what did it do? The pleasant land. And what, who else did it conquer? Conquered Egypt. Conquered Egypt. It didn't conquer the king of the south. It ceased to be the king of the south in 47 B.C., but there was a rebellion. Anthony, Cleopatra, and Caesar. They had to go quell the rebellion, and they had to do another battle, 31 B.C. So, just it. This is all I want you to see. Minor point. I hope I don't lose anyone on this minor point, but I want you to see it. Pagan Rome becomes the king of the north in verse 16. Yes, when he conquers Syria in verse 16, he's conquered Babylon. He is now king of the north. And the prophetic history that the pioneers point to is that it's going to conquer Egypt, the pleasant land, or Egypt, who is still the king of the south, the pleasant land, and then it's going to go back to Egypt. Much of the history that has been fulfilled in this prophecy will be repeated. The king of the north in verse 40, who are his three obstacles? the king of the south, the glorious land, and Egypt. This is a history, and when you look at it prophetically, that's paralleling the last six verses of Daniel 11. Now, am I losing you? Because there's only one real point I want to make here. Are you following me? The pagan Rome walked through this same history in a prophetic sense. The first thing it had to do is become the king of the north if it was going to set forth a prophetic example, and it did that when it conquered Babylon, which was part of Syria. Then it took Egypt, which at that, up to that point was the king of the south, and it had to come back to Egypt to quell the rebellion of Anthony and Cleopatra in 31 BC. But it had already ceased to be the king of the south uh, years before that, so it wasn't coming back to the king of the south, it was coming back to Egypt. It's the same geographical symbols as the king of the north in verse 40. But, um, let's, let's read verse 17. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of woman, corrupting her, but sh she shall not stand on his side, neither be with him. Now, Uriah Smith is going to comment on this. The war growing more threatening, Caesar sent into all the neighboring countries for help. Antipater, the Edomian, joined him with 3,000 Jews. The Jews who held the passes into Egypt permitted the army to pass on without interruption. Without this cooperation on their part, the whole plan must have failed. That's the point I want to make. In order for Rome to deal with Egypt, it needed the help of the Jews. It needed the help of the glorious land. And brothers and sisters, in order for the king of the north to bring down the king of the south in verse 40 of Daniel 11, there was an alliance formed between the king of the north and the glorious land. And it's in the history of Daniel 11. Okay, that's the kind of histories that are in Daniel 11 that are impacting a, a thorough study of the last six verses of Daniel 11. I'm not trying to make a point on this. I'm just trying to emphasize that when Sister White says much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated, she means just that. And as students of prophecy, we should be familiar with this history 
And I, and I tell you what, I'm not familiar with it. I know, I know, as I'm listening to Russell, I know what all of you are going through. Russell has the ability to take this history with all its details, and 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 bring them together, and he remembers the dynamics of them all. The brethren in London that are familiar with Russell, am I accurate? Raise your hand if I just gave an accurate representation. So if you are listening to what he's saying and your head is swimming, all I can tell you is that's standard for the material, but it's good material. You need to listen closely. You need to get the tape. You need to listen a few times because God's given him that gift. But the gift is to be able to be familiar with those histories and the dynamics of those histories and bring them down to the end of the world and learn all the lessons that have been encoded in God's word prophetically. Because when we do, the light about the end of the world just magnifies. But I'm getting behind. The rule we've dealt with, literal and spiritual, we're still trying to get into verse 40. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 47. Galatians 3, 29, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Before the time period of the cross, prophecy is literal. After the time period of the cross, prophecy is spiritual. Daniel 11, verse 40. And at the time of the end, 1798, is that before the cross or after the cross? It's after the cross. We're looking for a spiritual application of this verse. And here's this verse for us broken down on some of the symbols that we need to identify. We already know that the time of the end is 1798. We need to understand who the king of the south is. Push, king of the north. King of the south. Well, from our previous study, the king of the south is the power that brought the deadly wound to the papacy in 1798. It's got to be France, atheistic France. The power that controls Egypt in 1798 would be the king of the north. Um, the, but in that time period, it will be the power that controls spiritual Egypt. Revelation 11, verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Was our Lord crucified in Sodom and Egypt? Yes and no. John is making sure that we understand that he's speaking in prophetic symbols here. He wants us to understand this and, uh, and treat it as such. Sister White commenting on this verse in Great Controversy 269 says, This is atheism. Egypt is atheism. This is atheism, and the nation represented by Egypt would give voice. What's it mean to give voice? Speak. It means to speak. What's it mean to speak? In Bible prophecy, what does it mean to speak? Action of a legislative and judicial branches. Did atheistic France speak? It spoke what? It spoke Sodom and Egypt. It wrote licentiousness, symbolized by Sodom, into its constitution. And it wrote Egypt into its constitution, symbolizing atheism. It spoke. This is atheism, and the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. Now, that, that word unbelief, that's a, a very good word um, to associate with atheism. The speaking of a nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. During the revolution in 1793, the world, for the first time, heard an assembly of men born and educated in civilization and assuming the right to govern one of the finest of the European nations uplift their united voice to deny the most solemn truth that man's soul receives and renounce unanimously the belief and worship of deity. The worldwide disseminations of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France, uh, bringing that time period right down to the end of the world. I mean, we, we need to understand the French Revolution if we're going to understand uh, the end of the world. The Great Controversy 271, France presented also the characteristics which especially distinguished Sodom. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a good quote. Let's follow this one through. 
France is the type of the end of the world. The French Revolution is the type of the end of the world. Continuing on. During the revolution, there was manifest a state of moral debasement and corruption similar to that which brought destruction upon the cities of the plains. And the historian presents together the atheism and the licentiousness of France as given in the prophecy. Intimately connected with these laws affecting religion was that which reduced the union of marriage, the most sacred engagement which human be beings can form and permanence of which leads most strongly to the consolidation of society to the state of a mere civil contract. You heard anything about civil unions in the United States recently? had an impact on the election, didn't it? Some people say that's the issue. You know, gay marriage or civil union, which way are you going to go on that? And it, the thing is, is that the, the United States is not willing to do the gay mar marriages, but they're willing to do the civil unions. And you know what? That's some of the same teachings of the French Revolution. It's right here now. According to the words of the prophet, then a little before the year 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would rise to make war upon the Bible, and in the land where the testimony of God's two witnesses should thus be silenced, there would be manifest the atheism of Pharaoh and the licentiousness of Sodom. This prophecy has received a most exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France. Brothers and sisters, the power that controlled spiritual Egypt in 1798 was France. The king of the north was atheistic France. And verse 40 is describing a war that begins in 1798 between atheism and Catholicism. It goes on to say that in time, the king of the north would return and sweep away the king of the south, the king of the north, the power that controls Babylon, um, Revelation 17, verses 3 through 5, identifies the woman that rides upon the beast as Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the whole earth. And Sister White commenting on that in the Great Controversy says the woman Babylon of Revelation 17, dropping down to the last sentence, the power that for so many years maintained despotic sway over the monarchs of Christendom is Rome. The power that controlled spiritual Babylon in 1798, making it the king of the north, is the papacy, even though we've established that in verse 31 already. This is just confirming it. Shall come against him like, and the him there is the king of the south, who will return against the king of the south like a whirlwind. Daniel and Revelation, you by Uriah Smith, um, page 250, during the wars and revolutions which for long ages succeeded, the geographical boundaries were frequently changed. We read this earlier, but I want to read it again. But whatever changes might occur, these first divisions of the empire must determine the names which these portions of the territory should ever afterward bear, or we have no standard by which to test the application of the prophecy. That is, whatever power at any time should occupy the territory which at first constituted the kingdom of the north, that power would be the king of the north, and whatever power should occupy that which at first constituted the king of the south, that power would so long be the king of the south. The point is this. The pioneers recognized, they identified, that who the king of the north and the king of the south were moved through history. And in verse 40, the power that dominated atheism in the beginning of the verse in 1798 was atheistic France. But as history marched on, there came a new power into history in 1917 that was the prima premier power dominating atheism, and that we know today as the former Soviet Union. Been former now for 15 years. And I spoke last night that one of the characteristics of the King of the South is revolution. There's a couple, uh, a quote about the French Revolution, and of course we know about the Russian Revolution. And uh, just for the record, just for the record, I've been teaching something erroneous until uh, I ran into the European brethren and they set me straight. When we have time to deal with uh, the prophecies of Fatima that be, were confirmed by a miracle on October 13, 1917, and the messages that have so much to do with the king of the north, uh, Russia, and we have time to deal with that history of 1917 and onward in connection with the birth of modern king of the south, the Soviet Union, in 1917. Um, historians call the R Russian Revolution three things. What do they call it? What are the three things? The Russian Revolution, 
the Bolshevik Revolution and the October Revolution. And because the, this, this 19, these two 1917 histories are so connected to each other, especially in verse 40, for me, the Fatima miracle on October 13th, 1917, I would always emphasize that one of the names for the Russian Revolution was the October Revolution. But I stand corrected. It's the name, the October Re Revolution, but the, the European brethren pointed out to me something I don't even know that I can articulate well, but in that time period, the Russians were still using an old calendar. And if you lined the, the time when the, the revolution took place, which at that time I, I believe was in October on the Russian calendar, it was really in the beginning of November on everybody else's calendar. So for everyone that's heard this story for the last 10 years, I won't make an emphasis on the October Revolution any longer because technically it was in November, but those histories are very closely related. Come against like a whirlwind. Come, you can see here from Strong's, it's to storm, uh, a, a fearful storm, to fearfully storm, a storm, a tempest, come like a whirlwind, against, uh, to ascend. Notice that one of the characteristics of this, this, this storm that sweeps away the Soviet Union is that at the same time the storm of sweeping away the Soviet Union is taking place, what's happening to the King of the North? He's ascending. What's he ascending? He's ascending the beast that decides to carry him at that time. When was the decision made? Well, if you listen to Larry King interview last night, uh, Ronald Reagan sat down privately in 1982 with the Pope of Rome. So somewhere in the Reagan years, in that time period, the woman got on the next beast of Bible prophecy and began to ascend when the Soviet Union, the King of the South, was being swept away. Uh, chariots and horsemen. Here's some quotes. Um, What's the example for studying the Bible that inspiration has given us? Uh, ah, yes, that's the example. I never got that answer before, but that's not the one I'm looking for. But yes, that is the that is one. What's the human example on how to study the Bible? And someone over there answered it, one of the sisters. William Miller. William Miller, Sister White points to as the example for studying the Bible. And how did William Miller study the Bible? With a concordance. And if you take a concordance and you look up chariots and horsemen, you will find verse after verse like these verses that emphasize that the chariots and horsemen are identifying military strength over and over. These are just a couple examples. And yes, there is going to be military strength involved with it. Letter 55, December 8, 1886. Nations will be stirred to their very center. Support will be withdrawn for those who proclaim God's only standard of righteousness as the only sure test of character. And all who will not bow to the decree of national councils and obey national laws to exalt the Sabbath instituted by the man of sin to disregard God's holy day will feel not the oppressive power of popery alone, but of the Protestant world, the oppressive power of the Protestant world, the image of the beast. Ships. What are ships? Also, if you use William Miller's um, technique, it's easy to see that ships in Bible prophecy, merchant ships, business, um, symbolizes economic power. Brothers and sisters, in verse 40, Rome never changes. Rome is the king of the north. And when Rome returns to sweep away the king of the south, it brings with it a military. This means, by definition, that Rome never changes, and inspiration says Rome never changes, that there had to be an alliance formed here of some kind. There had to be a power that brought military and economic strength into the, uh, to the alliance. And what power in Bible prophecy has two horns that represent military and economic strength? The United States at the end of the world began with republicanism and Protestantism, but when it begins to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy, and when does it fulfill, begin to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy? What verse in the Bible can you take me to that demonstrates that the United States has begun to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy? No, Revelation 16 tells us that yes, 
the, the United States will be the false prophet, and Revelation 13 tells us how it will act as the false prophet, but Daniel 11 verse 40 identifies that the role has begun because Protestant America forms a secret alliance with the Antichrist of Bible prophecy, and by definition of Protestant, at that point, it's apostate Protestantism. You can't have an alliance with Rome and still be a Protestant. Verse 40 is a very powerful verse. This is where you can put your finger on a verse and say, this is where it started, and where did it start? In the Reagan years, the Reagan years. And at that point, its two horns are not republicanism and Protestantism. Countries. Uh, countries in the study of the last six verses of Daniel 11 are it, one of the things you should look at is that in verse 41 it says, He shall also enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. That word countries in verse 41, what's different about it? It's supplied, it's italicized doesn't belong in verse 41, but in verse 42, it says he shall enter into, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries. It does belong there. So you have three countries in three verses. In the second verse, it doesn't belong there. But in the first verse, what that tells us is that whoever the king of the south is, when he's finally swept away by the papacy and its ally, it had to be a confederacy of countries. It wasn't a singular country. Was the Soviet Union a confederacy of countries? Brothers and sisters, this verse is so simple, but it's so powerful. It's so powerful. There's so much in this. Um, here's the ally from Revelation 13. It's the United States that exercises the power. And if you look in Daniel um, 8, 6, and 7, um, it defines for us power in Bible prophecy and that power that is under discussion as Alexander the Great um, comes into history is military power. That's the, the characteristic of Alexander the Great's power here in this verse here, these two verses here, Daniel 8, 6, and 7. Power is military strength. The papacy never possessed its own military strength, chariots and horsemen must symbolize supplied military strength. At the time when the papacy robbed of its strength was forced to desist from persecution, John beheld a new power coming up to echo the dragon's voice and carry forward the same cruel and blasphemous work. This power, the last that is to wage war against the church and the law of God, is represented by a beast with lamb-like horns. The beast preceding it had risen from the sea, but this came up out of the earth, representing the peaceful rise of the nation which it symbolized, the United States. As we continue over here on this board, we're just getting this started on the beast dragon and the false prophet, and we can continue to put uh, information about the beast dragon and false prophet together. We're going to refer to Revelation 13, 2, that each of these three powers are represented in Revelation 13, 2, the dragon is the symbol of authority, civil authority. The beast is the one that sits upon the whole threefold arrangement. But the false prophet, it's the one that delivers the power, military power. Uh, there's roles that these three entities play, and the role of the United States in end time Bible prophecy is the military power, and you, you need to be clear about that. Um, because sometimes if you're not, you stumble over how is it that the ten kings burn the horse with fire and eat her flesh when we know that the, the military power at that time isn't the ten kings, it's the United States. So just keep that in mind. We're moving that direction. Um, overflow and pass over, enter into the countries as the countries of the former Soviet Union. And we looked at some of the historical evidence last night that confirmed these things. And for the record, Glenn, as you're producing this, this presentation should go before last night's presentation. Um, 
I'm, I'm unsure anymore. I, I used to think I was sure. Maybe I was right in the beginning, but I don't remember no, now. I need to go back and check my resources. But I believe it was 1845 or 1846. If anyone knows, you can correct me for, if you know. Um, 1845, 1846, in that time frame, was the first time that Seventh-day Adventists in print identified the second beast of Revelation 13, the United States, uh, as the lamb-like beast. You know, they, may have, they may have known it before that time, but, bef but publicly put it in print. It was right after the Great Disappointment. So you, you think about what Adventists were saying from that time period onward. What were they saying? They're saying there's going to come a time when the United States is going to force the whole world to worship the beast of Catholicism. And how ridiculous was that in the 1840s? How ridiculous was that? That was the Advent message. And then you get to the 1860s when we're having a civil war amongst ourselves, the bloodiest war we ever had. We couldn't solve our own problems, but Seventh-day Adventists were there, and they were saying the United States was going to force the whole world to worship the beast of Catholicism. Uh, not realistic. You get to World War I, takes a, a confederacy of countries to bring that war to an end, just like World War II. Advent message, still the same. The only difference is, is by that time, we begin to forget what our message really is, but that's not the point of this talk. You get to the Korean War, little tiny Korean, all the United States could do is fight to a draw. <laughs> and little tiny Korea left the, the country divided. But Seventh-day Adventists say the United States is going to force the whole world to worship the beast of Catholicism. Then we go to Vietnam and we lose. Now, we're not given the message much anymore by the Vietnam era, but the message still is the United States is going to force the whole world to worship the beast of Catholicism. And then in 1991, the first Iraq war, the whole world seen that the United States had missiles that can go down the street and make a right turn and go down the street and make a left turn and hit the target right on the nose. They have bombs that can come in an air duct and go down to whatever floor they want and blow up at that floor. They have bombers that cannot be detected by radar. And the whole world knew we had a world policeman in 1991. And then, and then in the last Iraq war, one of the main problems is they got the job done too quick. It just happened too quick. With they got to Baghdad before they thought they'd get to Baghdad. And they had problems by getting there too fast, brothers and sisters. Why? Why did our message suddenly become present truth? Because of the fulfillment of verse 40 of Daniel 11. Verse 40 of Daniel 11 turned the message of Adventism into present truth because the counterbalance to the power of the United States was swept away overnight and suddenly the United States stood alone and the message that had been truth since 1844, 45, 46 turned into present truth overnight. Unfortunately, the people that are proclaim this present truth message don't seem to understand it or they want to fight against it. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a wonderful verse in your word. And we know there's much more light in this verse than we've recognized so far and we ask that you'd stimulate us to continue to dig. But we also recognize that this verse, among other things, is announcing verse 41. When the line is drawn in the sand for Seventh-day Adventists in terms of their probation. And we want to be among those that receive the seal of God at that time and receive the latter rain and proclaim the loud cry message. And we know that uh, it's only going to happen through your power, through your spirit. And we ask that you would give us that power and spirit at this time and give us the discernment we need to see the part we have to play in our personal salvation. Give us the courage and willingness to bring that to pass. As we continue this school the rest of the day, we ask that you would be here with us as we know you've been and that you'd send angels here as well and uh, fill this place up uh, that the, the light we received this week will be emanating from us as we return home in Jesus' name.